Thank you, Jane, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, here who's come out this evening to what feels like the beginning of the summer lecture series, but in fact, here we are in the fall. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce my very good friend of many years, Jeff Quilter. Uh, Jeff is the William and Muriel Seabury Howells Director of the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology and Senior Lecturer on Anthropology at Harvard. Jeff was born in uh, New York City. He's a, he's a consummate New York City boy. He received his BA in, in Social Sciences from the College of the University of Chicago and his MA and PhD in Anthropology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Jeff is an anthropological archeologist. His research interests, which are wide and varied and are represented in a truly impressive publication record, and I'll mention that more uh, specifically a bit later on, include interests and research, long time research in Andean South America, the Moche culture of the north coast of Peru, and especially their politics, history, society, and religion. Uh, he's been interested in interactions between and shared culture among New World peoples, having excavated archaeological sites from Costa Rica to the uh, central coast of Peru. Uh, and, he, and he's also been interested in social change and transformations and the limits and potential of archaeology in understanding the past. So his interests are uh, wide and varied indeed. Um, Professor Quilter's early career was focused on questions of the origins of sedentism, uh, which he studied excavating the site of Paloma on the coast of Peru, and the study of complex societies uh, which he pursued in excavations at the sites of Media Luna and El Paraiso. During the period of instability in Peru, or the period of Sendero Luminoso, uh, during the uh, 1980s and the 1990s, uh, Jeff switched his research focus to examine the art and iconography of the, of the Moche of Peru. He also developed an interest at this time in the different discourses of art, of, of, of art history, anthropology, and history, in discussing the past. Since 2002, uh, he has been working in cooperation with Peruvian archaeologists at the El Brujo archaeological uh, complex in the Chicama Valley on the central coast of Peru. Uh, and currently, he directs a multidisciplinary study of a 16th to, to 17th century colonial town and church complex at the place of Santa Magdalena de Cal Viejo at uh, El Brujo. He has on three, at least three occasions, led the Harvard Summer School Joint Harvard Catolica University from Lima, uh, archaeological field school at the extraordinary site of San Jose de Moro, accompanied by his Peruvian colleague, Luis Jaime Castillo. Uh, Jeff has published numerous books and edited volumes on a wide and impressive array of topics in archaeology and culture and art history. His monographs include Life and Death at Paloma, Society and Mortuary Practices in a Pre-Ceramic Peruvian Village, published in 1989, Cobble Circles and Standing Stones, Archaeology at the Rivas Site in Costa Rica, that was published in 2004, Treasures of the Andes, 2005, The Moche of Ancient Peru, Media and Messages, which he published for the Peabody Museum here in 2010, and uh, the great, uh, 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 a truly extraordinary synthetic work on Peruvian archaeology uh, entitled The Ancient Central Andes, published uh, by Routledge in 2014. His book on the Moche of Ancient Peru, uh, which as Jane Pickering just mentioned, features the Peabody's collection of Moche ceramics will, will be available for sale uh, after the lecture at the table to my right. Uh, Jeff has taught at Ripon College, Wisconsin, uh, from 1981 to 1995. Uh, he served as director of pre-Columbian studies and curator of the pre-Columbian collection at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, D.C., from 1995 to 2005. Just sit still. I'll finish this soon. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, from 2005 to 2011, he served as deputy director for curatorial uh, affairs and curator of intermediate area archaeology at the Peabody Museum, and in 2012 he was appointed as director of the Peabody Museum. Uh, Jeff teaches courses in the archaeology program in the anthropology department, including courses on ancient Peru, 
Moche culture and history and archaeological methods and theory. Uh, the talk we will have the privilege of hearing tonight is one of the, the uh, first, if not the first, presentation of materials that he recently researched during a sabbatical at the Bard Graduate Center in New York. This was during a sabbatical in spring 2017. So this is all uh, fresh new material and uh, very excited. And uh, so uh, please join me in welcoming Jeff Quilter. Coming and thank you, Jane. Whoa. And th thank you, Jane. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some re research I've been doing lately. And I thought I'd begin by uh, going back to a wonderful talk we had here uh, a week ago this past Monday by uh, that wonderful archaeologist Simon Martin, who talked about the Maya. And even for those of you who um, were not here for that talk, the Maya are extremely well known. They're probably one of the best known pre-Columbian cultures uh, because of their wonderful art and um, because of the great amount of research that's been done on them, uh, uh, of which the Peabody Museum and the Department of Anthropology at Harvard has a long and storied tradition. If you go to our third floor galleries, you'll see uh, impressive Maya art. I think I'm getting, yeah, I think that's better. Um, and one of the things that Simon said, and is true, is that one of the great powers of Maya archaeology is that it has the opportunity to look at texts so that we can actually look or we can actually read and understand the voices of the Maya themselves. And he gave us a diagram something like this. And there's that overlap between the texts and the artifacts. There's also a tension between them as well, in that they don't always read the same way or say the same things. But tonight I'm going to talk about a different situation, uh, about a culture that is more or less contemporary with the Maya, but is in South America on the north coast of Peru. And instead of having two overlapping circles, we just have one. Because the Moche, also known as the Mochica, did not have writing. They also, it's important to remember, did not have a cash or money economy, among many other things. So we just have that one circle. We just have artifacts. Although, we do have a little circle because there are long-standing cultural traditions, and there are, there are historical accounts that can be generally connected to some things we can see in Moche archaeology. But by and large, we mostly have archaeology. And by and large, the concepts we work with are ones that we create ourselves in looking at the past, looking at archaeological sites and looking at artifacts. So Moche is an archaeological culture. As far as we know, no one ever called him or herself a Moche, except for the current residents of the town of Moche in the Moche Valley. Otherwise, the term is one we have imposed upon a set of artifacts set in a distinctive artifacts in a limited time and space. That's what an archaeological culture is. And here we have it. So we have distinctive artifacts represented by these two objects here, and we have the north coast of Peru, and we have this distinctive time period, roughly from about 350 to 850 of the current era, or AD. About the same time as the Maya, Maya a little earlier, and a little later, and a little earlier as well, but it's generally the ballpark, the classic Maya. Now, the study of the Moche, also known as Mochica, has a long history of investigation, just like the Maya. Um, we have accounts from the colonial period. Even though the Moche were long dead, their ruins were around, and Spanish colonial writers talked about it, wrote it down, though they didn't know how to figure these things. Um, and the first systematic archaeological investigations of Moche remains was by a visiting German archaeologist, Max Ule, over there, who worked at the largest Moche temples, known as wakas, adobe 
temples um, in the Moche Valley. Why are you saying Moche a lot? Um, and he, this was some of the earliest professional archaeology done in South America. He actually worked a little bit earlier elsewhere in Peru, but this is among the earliest projects done by professional archaeologists in Peru. But he then left. He actually wound up um, in San Francisco working for uh, Phoebe Hearst of the newspaper fortune. And it was really uh, a, a local landowner, a lo local hacendado named Rafael Larco Oile, who was the person who really created modern moche studies. And uh, Oile is a fascinating character. I, I wish we had time to talk about him, but he was a very sophisticated man. He went to C uh, Cornell University and got a degree in agronomy so he could run his estates better. And he was a very sophisticated, worldly person who lived on his hacienda in the valley right next to the Moche Valley, known as the Chicama Valley, and started off doing amateur, basically amateur archaeology, but at a very professional level for his time. And he amassed lots of collections, and he did a very important thing, which is he published. He published his results, and it was he who came up with this idea of the Moche culture as distinct. And here we have a quote that Larco made. Uh, I won't read it, but if you read it, you can see that he was extremely proud of Moche culture. He saw it as a golden age of society in ancient Peru. And he conceptualized it as a vast civilization under a sophisticated form of government with a, a sophisticated system of rulership and so forth and so on. Remember, he was writing this in 1945, right at the end of World War II, when the idea of nation states, the idea of you know, peaceful and prosperous societies as opposed to the ravages that had occurred in Europe took place. So his vision was clearly shaped by his times and his, and his understanding of the archaeology of the day. And it, it prevailed, actually, for many, many years, almost 40 years. And we still rely upon Larco's vision today. Um, many, many of his insights still are extremely important in doing uh, Moche archaeology. But our view has changed. And it's changed from research that's been done, particularly since the late 1980s uh, into the 1990s to the present day. Um, we could go, we could have a whole lecture about those changes, but we don't have time. So I will just note that he had a view of uniformity in Moche society and a single system of government that stretched across nine different river valleys on the north coast of Peru. He also, and critical to the understanding of how this view developed, he had this concept that mochi ceramics represented a corporate style. They represented a style coming from a central administration and planning, and that the kinds of ceramics were uniform and changed systematically from, this is, uh, from the earliest phase here, phase one, to phase two, to phase three, to phase four, to phase five. And based upon what he knew at the time, this made perfect sense. But as in all scientific research, the more you know, the more complicated things usually get. And so um, because of that research that was done in uh, the last 30 years, we now know that Larco's five-stage model um, doesn't hold, that the ceramic uh, sequences are much more complex. And since those ceramic sequences were used as the means to understand the chronology of Moche, the chronology has somewhat fallen apart. And although, that's a good thing, because now we're re-examining that altogether. Similarly, ideas about corporate labor and groups of lab laborers working on big temples have become complicated. So this idea of marked adobes, we have these adobes with distinctive marks in them, that were once thought to represent labor groups and so forth and so on, has become more complicated. The consequences are, uh, and one problem that has existed is over these many, many years of doing research um, in, the, in the Larco mode, there were not a lot of radiocarbon dates taken because the idea that the five-phase sequence was rock solid was so strong that it just perdured in the face of everything else. Uh, now we have a different view. Similarly, 
Here, so here's the valleys. Um, and at one time, the Moche State was thought to uh, stretch from the far south here all the way up to the northern valleys here as one single system. Um, the sort of general, accept, uh, general view of Moche's uh, culture these days is that the, the northern Moche and these valleys up here are individual polities or political systems of some sort. And that, uh, but the idea of a single Moche system down here still maintains itself for a variety of reasons. I frankly don't think that this is likely, partly because of what I call the cartographic fallacy. And it's just a simple thing that we do with maps. When we do maps and we want to show the area of influence for a particular culture, we color them in like this, right? Like a nation state, like we do coloring France blue and England or Britain uh, pink and so forth and so on. But in actual fact, did any pre-industrial society, was, could any pre-industrial society actually control and did it want to control the deserts in between these valleys? I think not. I think it's more likely that you know, the, the concentration of power and population and economics and everything else was in a valley to valley system and that would very likely lead to valley to valley political systems. Now, <clears throat> all of Moche's studies radically changed in 1987. And in 1987, a discovery was made that literally transformed uh, not only just um, Moche studies, but it transformed Peru's understanding of its past because it was the uncovering of the most elaborate gold burial ever found in the New World at a site called Sipan, um, in which it's a long story, it's also a very elaborate story of how this all came about, but basically, Archaeologists had not been digging in temples looking for big tombs previously for a variety of reasons. Again, too complicated to go into now, but um, it was not done, partly because there was some of these sites are so badly destroyed from looting, is that the supposition was is that there probably wasn't left to ex much to, left to excavate. And in this excavation, which was um, done by Peruvian archaeologist Walter Alva and with uh, uh, American archaeologist Christopher Donnan. Um, they found this spectacular tomb of a man who had uh, died in, uh, in the Moche times and been buried with this sumptuous wealth. Um, elaborate ear spools, three different uh, sets of ear spools here, um, and uh, uh, all sorts of ornaments and decorations and costumes that could be reconstructed as you see in this figure here. Um, now that excavation took place very slowly starting in 1987. The results really didn't start coming out that other people could appreciate them until the 1990s, early 1990s. And at about the same time, another discovery was made, also by Christopher Dolan, really the, you know, the, one of the great archaeologists of of Moche and Mochica cultures uh, working in the United States um, at UCLA and um, has done an you know, amazing job of, of publishing his work as well. And uh, he, working with a young student who's since become a major archaeologist who's been here at Harvard, uh, Luis Jami Castillo, found another set of remarkable burials. And these were women, a series of women who were uh, buried in a large chamber also with all sorts of metalwork. The metalwork's turned green, but it's because it's a gold copper alloy and the, the copper tends to corrode, so the object turns green even though it has a high amount of gold and with a sacrifice burial outside of it, lots of other uh, artifacts. And this was remarkable furthermore because a connection was made between these burials and Moche art. Now, a lot of previous Moche studies had been done looking at art because the art was available, because there were huge numbers of Moche ceramics in museums. The Peabody Museum has one of the outstanding collections of Moche ceramics in North America, um, and a lot of these collections were made in in times when the standards are not of what they are today, and, the, and uh, some of them were made 
through uh, the illegal excavations of archaeological sites in Peru, and uh, these collections exist, and so they're, and because of the Moche art style being so representational, another thing it shares with the Maya, although in a different style, um, you can you can identify individuals on the basis of their costumes and ornaments and so forth. And it was found that the, the Lord of Sipan, uh, as well as the burials at San Jose de Moro, the site, linked to uh, individuals seen in the art. For example, this is a replica of the burial at San Jose de Moro, um, buried with these large ornamental uh, devices that correspond to the jester headdress of this woman figured in the art here. And the um, Lord of Sipan links to this figure here, some used to be known as the Ray Deity. But suddenly, we had more than just the art. We actually had the burials. And in the subsequent years, uh, between the late 1980s to today, a number of large-scale burials of elites have been found up and down the coast of Peru. In fact, there's uh, about five of them, five or six of them, depending on your count, one, two, three, four, five, six, six. Um, and they are available to study. And uh, a little aside here as to how I came to do this. I was granted the wonderful opportunity of having a sabbatical last spring term. And I, I went to this great place called the Bard Graduate Center in New York City that does very interesting studies and combinations of research on material culture. And I originally had a plan to do some other project, but it didn't, wasn't available. It didn't work through as I had planned. And so I was kind of left without my original plan being able to be carried out. And I thought, you know, I should go back and really read all those Moche publications in more detail than I had done before. Uh, scholars often work by reading sort of selectively and very quickly. And so I was given the luxury of being able to read in more details. And I started reading all these reports on these elaborate um, moche burials. And I got very excited because um, what I realized is there was a lot of data there um, on each of the sets of burials, if you will. And it seemed that no one had actually stepped back and tried to make comparisons between the different tombs. Um, the Peruvian archaeologists and the American archaeologists and other foreigners who've worked on these tombs have done amazing jobs of publication, very thorough publishing of the details, but um, no one ever, ever actually looked at, you know, how does the Lord of Sipan compare with these other burials? And so I started to do that. And I could, so this is archaeology without getting dirty. Um, the digging had been done. The reports had been written on the individual sites. But the, this was archaeology of looking at data across different um, sites. And as you can see, um, there's a lot, and lo a lot of burials. So uh, at Sipan, we don't have just the Lord of Sipan. We actually have a total of about 29 burials that could be interpreted as elite or mostly, most of whom could be interpreted as elite. So um, here's an example of, of those barrows, just listed here so you can see it. But what I want to draw your attention to is the nature of archaeological inqu inquiry, which is primarily pattern recognition, looking for patterns in data. And of course, this is something that's not unique to archaeology. It happens in many, many disciplines. If you start looking for patterns in your data of repeating occurrences, it can lead to at least seeing correlations. Every time I get this, this also seems to occur as well. Now, correlation is not causation. We can't prove that one thing means another. But in a situation, as we have with the Moche, where we do not have written, written sources, um, we can at least advance carefully in seeing correlations and making some cautious links as to what those correlations might mean as possible causations. So here's ex some examples of the variety of burials uh, produced in a marvelous volume by Walter Alva, these wonderful uh, sort of uh, uh, blow-ups, I guess, of the burials, all separated in terms of their different grave goods. They're reported in, in great detail. 
um, including the animal sacrifices, the sort of, uh, and some of them are quite simple, although we may wonder, you know, if you're buried in one of these in temple mounds, are you, are you the, except for sacrifice, in other words, human sacrifices, those were certainly not elites, we would assume, um, but if, you, if you're buried with relatively few objects, but you're buried in a temple, are you, is that an indicator of your, that you're an elite? Because many, of these peop many other people were getting buried in, in their villages or in other places. But we'll leave that question for now. So just to run through a couple of these, here's the Lord of Zipan. Okay? And what I started doing in doing this pattern recognition is I, I could see that there were certain kinds of artifacts that occurred over and over again. So the Lord of Zipan had three different masks that were placed on him. He had three different sets of no, nose ornaments, which are known as narigueras, okay? nose ornaments. He had four crowns, oh, those are normal, three pairs of ear ornaments, 15 necklaces, a pora is a two-handled club, uh, other kinds of weapons, 30 weapons, and uh, standards, we'll talk about those in a minute, and there were nine humans associated with him. Now, not all those were sacrifices, but there were nine other human individuals associated with him and two yamas, which were sacrificed. There's also the old lord of Sipan, okay? um, an earlier burial, also of a high-ranking individual. But notice he had seven masks and eight nariweras, and, but only three crowns, and so forth and so on. So interesting patterns. Um, they seem to have the same kinds of materials, although the number per burial seems to vary, per elite burial. Um, here's another one. This is a, another site. Um, so the, the Sipan's in a northern valley known as the Lambayeque Valley, um, Lambayeque Valley system. Uh, this one's a little farther down the coast um, and was excavated by a Canadian archaeologist named Steve Bourget. Um, and uh, he found a, a guy known as the Lord of Ukupe, uh, who had three masks, five nariweras, but 18 crowns, okay. so forth and so on. Uh, one weapon, uh, it was three humans, not, of whom are, not all of whom are sacrificed. It's sometimes hard to know if someone's a sacrifice or not. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. And one yama. Also, interestingly enough, um, the Lord of Ukupe had a lot of silver instead of gold in his burial. And uh, uh, the Lord of Ukupe also had a lot of these poras, these double-handed maces uh, or clubs, right? many more than the uh, Lord of Sipa. At another site, uh, Dos Cabezas, uh, excavated by Christopher Dunn. It's called Dos Cabezas because it's got two heads, the waka has got two heads. It was originally a solid temple, elaborate temple, but it got split in two by uh, looting in the colonial era that dug this huge trench in the middle and wound up with uh, a, a, decle a declivity in the middle, so it's known locally as Dos Cabezas. And uh, Chris found um, a number of burials. Uh, it seems of um, people of somewhat lesser rank, perhaps, if we judge that on the basis of the number of objects. Um, the richest one was Tomb 2, amazingly found with a Nariwara still in place and a crown still on his head. Um, one mask, seven Nariwaras, 14 crowns, and so forth and so on. So, in going through all this material, it seemed, it, I came to the conclusion that there's a standard pattern here, and it's, um, so this lists sort of the basic outfit of your standard moche lord uh, as found in these tombs. So you have uh, a frontlet or crest. Um, if it's a helmet-like device, it's a crest. If it's a crown, it tends to be a frontlet, an object placed in the front, like a crest. Uh, then a crown or a helmet. Um, plumes were often found, not shown here. Um, the nose rings, ear ornaments, uh, necklaces, a pectoral, this large bib-like device, like a big necklace of fine beads, called pectoral, whoops, and uh, let's go back, and a tunic, so not always with all these little gold plates, but sometimes, uh, a standard, which is this device, it's a, it's a device often uh, uh, gilded, 
that uh, appears to have perhaps been used like a banner or like a flag that was maybe carried around by an assistant when the Lord you know, was walking around and, becoming, and being important. Uh, bracelets are almost always included. A rattle knife of some kind. Um, belts with belt rattles. Tinklers. And uh, a back flap. It's shown here, which we'll get to in a minute. Or some kind of accessory in the back. And again, there's a little variation, but this seems to be the general outfit of a moche lord when he was buried. You notice I'm saying he, because most of these burials are male, with a, a few exceptions, one of which is at San Jose de Moro, as I showed you. Um, so there's, um, uh, just looking at crowns, okay, we have a, this is a depiction of a warrior, so he has a headdress with a, with a crest on it. Um, this is an unusual, so we have some unusual representations in the art. We can't place archaeologically because we've never found anything like this archaeologically. But these down here sort of fit the pattern more of what we're seeing, for example, at San Jose de, uh, at um, Dos Cabezas and at other sites, of a cylindrical crown, usually made of metal, and then with a frontlet placed on it. Sometimes they call it a diadem. Um, I prefer frontlet as part of uh, the ornamentation. And here's one of the crests found. Uh, I think that's at uh, Sipan. Okay. Um, one of the things I discovered in looking at these patterns is um, that ear ornaments seem to be uh, only in the graves of a very few of the highest elites. Okay, so ear ornaments are found only uh, of the, with the Lord of Sipan, the old Lord of Sipan, the Lord of Ukupe that we saw, um, the warrior priest, which is another burial we'll talk about a little bit later, but also with warriors. So at Sipan, there are some burials, of clearly non I mean, apparently non elite, uh, buried. Uh, Robust men who were, may have been sacrificed, who were in the, you know, rel re apparently relatively good health, buried with a club and a few objects, but including um, ear, ear spools, okay? usually simple wooden ones. And at, um, at the Wakas de Moche site um, that we talked about earlier, uh, Christopher Donnan. And, and another woman, a woman named Carol Mackey, found um, a set of burials that seemed to be buried apart and appeared to be warriors. Again, they were a prime age for being warriors, and they all had ear spools too. So I think that ear spools are associated with warriorship, and that's why they only occur among certain men. There are Adult men buried with lots and lots of goods, no weapons though, and they don't have ear spools. So I think I found a connection between um, the wearing of ear spools and the role of men as warriors. It's further emphasized because there's an indication that um, junior, juniors, young men, don't have ear spools. They have, they have these ear tubes. This is a, clearly a young individual, judging by his juvenile-looking face. He's wearing ear tubes uh, running through his ear ornaments. And this fellow here from a very early, uh, early 20th century publication has his, has his, his uh, tubes in a different angle. Uh, but I suspect that this is like an age-grade system. It's quite likely many, many societies of warriors start off as a junior warrior, then you have to do something in order to, to get ra uh, raised to the rank of being a senior warrior. So the back flap, a true moche tail, um, is, sorry, is uh, shown in depictions of warriors, various kinds. Uh, they seem like they'd be very inconvenient as devices to wear in battle. Um, some people think a lot of mochi battles were primarily ritual. It's possible that some battles were ritual, that, or that better, that some rituals were done as battles. But we have lots of evidence to suggest that there are lots of real battles. And uh, we find these ceremonial back flaps 
This is of heavy gold um, and was found with the Lord of Sipan. It would not be, or at Sipan, it would not be uh, practical to wear this into battle by any means. It would inconvenience you, so it's probably a ceremonial item. And uh, we do have not found any examples of what, you know, back flaps that may have been used uh, for combat uh, may have looked like. But, uh, so those are clearly warrior associated. We also have things called back accessories. Um, this one was found at the Wapas de Moche site, and this was found at the site called Wakakao Viejo, uh, where I've worked. And we have uh, Moche representations of uh, one of these back, ac back accessories here, on the back here, and here's another one here as well. Um, they, they seem like they're kind of backpacks, because the ones that have been found actually have had objects in them, like little bits and pieces of gold left over. Um, but but it's, it's clearly not a practical object. It's clearly part of a ceremonial outfit. Okay. Again, looking at pattern recognition, another thing I found is that nose ornaments, or narihueras, seem to be among the most precious objects of Moche elite. They're not, however, restricted to the uppermost ranks of the Moche elite. They seem to be much more commonly distributed, but they're, but they're often found on the nose or in the vicinity of the nose or next to the face, and, but sometimes they're often shown, actually found in the hands of individuals, um, and sometimes in both hands. So they seem to have some kind of value that it's related to adornment and potentially for prestation, that is to say for giving perhaps from one lord to another as uh, gifts or exchanging in, for treaties or so forth and so on. As I said, this is not an, a money economy, so it w wasn't on the basis of, of cash, but, but these may have been like, almost like a proto-money among the elite, only for the elite. Um, also, pectorals seem to be extremely... Um, uh, for, uh, reserved for only the very highest ranks. Um, necklaces, however, are quite common and seem to be a very personal type of item. The variation in necklaces is huge. You have um, things made of very tiny beads. You have other things made of larger beads. Um, you have some barrows with lots and lots of necklaces and some barrows with very few. So a, a real necklace, uh, long descending uh, cord with small uh, beads on it seems to be quite common, but the pectorals were, again, only for uh, the elites. Um, so this is kind of a summary. Um, if we compare the various lords, these are not all of them, but some of them, uh, we'll see that um, the red uh, boxes indicate the individual with the highest number of different ornaments. So the Lord of Sipan really knocks it out of the ballpark in having the highest number of ear ornaments. This is pairs of ear ornaments. Highest number of necklaces, highest number of weapons, highest number of humans associated with him, and the highest number of yamas. Okay. Um, but the Lord of Ukupe actually has the greatest number of crowns. Now, I don't think this is... I don't know what this means. I don't know how... We'll ever figure out what this means. I think it must mean something. It may be simply an individual lord's preference for having his workmen, his craftsmen, make various kinds of objects. Um, but um, it seems to me the overall pattern that there's a common set of burial equipment that goes to the grave with you um, is, more, is, is interesting. And what these variable patterns might mean uh, remains to be seen. Another thing that I found that is rather interesting is the role of these little crudely made ceramics that are found at various moche sites. And um, they're sometimes found in groups, often groups based on f the number five. The moche seem to have had a, either a five-based or a ten-based uh, number system. Um, but they're not always. Sometimes you, there are odd numbers, like 15 or 13. Um, at Dos Cabezas, there were separate groups in the grave of these little, um, what Christopher Donnan calls ofrendas. And um, 
Here's some in a tomb at San Jose de Moro. There were a bunch of smashed ones at Dos Cabezas. And these seem to be some kind of little offering that is being made at the funeral site itself. Um, and I think one of the things that we've not really looked on until recently is how much the remains found in tombs represent the actual practices of the funeral rather than representing you know, the goods that are being buried with an individual from his or her life. Um, and so perhaps these little uh, ofrendas represent, could they have represented the number of people who are at the funeral ceremony? Possibly, although it's very hard to say. It might be so, given the fact that you find them in these odd numbers and in these little groups around uh, and in uh, cemeteries, with the highest lords having the greatest number of these kinds of uh, offerings. So we've talked about a lot about men. What about the ladies? Well, <clears throat> there are the, um, the uh, San Jose de Moro burials. Um, we're still waiting for some results of those uh, publications of those burials. But um, I had the privilege of being involved at a site called um, Huacacao Viejo at the El Brujo Archaeological Complex in the Chicama Valley where a high-status woman was um, excavated a few years ago who's known as the Senora de Cao. Cao is the name of the site. This was a, like a little uh, patio. It may have been roofed at the time in which she was buried along with other uh, high-ranking individuals. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is a representation of the senora, uh, played by an, an actor. And um, it demonstrates uh, the artifacts found in her grave. Uh, she, there were actually a number of these uh, frontlets found, about three or four of them. But what's fascinating is that this woman, who probably died around the age of 25, unfortunately, maybe a little older, was gendered as both male and female. So as female, she was buried with these long spindles with little spindle whorls on them. And uh, if you know about textiles, a spindle whorl this small with a spindle that long must have been for very, very finely spun cotton. And golden needles, wow. Golden needles to sew with. And uh, weaving and textile work has been described as the quintessential women's role in the Andes. So this is, if that was true for the moche, she's clearly being gendered, even with high status weaving or textile equipment, as female when it comes to these materials. But also in her grave, there were um, 44 nose ornaments, 44 of the most exquisite, beautiful uh, examples of moche metalwork uh, that have ever been found. And there were 23 ceremonial spear throwers. We had the world's leading expert on uh, ceremony on spear throwers, a uh, fellow who teaches at Grinnell College, come and look at the spear throwers. And he confirmed what was obvious to us, is that these could never have been actually used. They're made of wood wrapped in metal. Um, they actually look like they were made primarily for a funeral because the metal some barely hung together on the objects. Uh, it's interesting, too, by the way, that number 23, if it was 22, it would work, you know, half of 44. I mean, it would work in terms of seeming to have some kind of pattern, but we have 23. Maybe one was the actual one she had. So it seems like, and, and of course, spear throwers, warfare, male activity, and nose rings also, male regalia. And again, it seems like the nose rings could have been linked to the idea of prestation, that these, along with the spear throwers, were brought to the senora, perhaps in life, but perhaps in death, as an offering for her funeral, or if she was alive as an offering period, from dependent lords and perhaps ladies in other communities. And, whoops, in terms of 
Where are we going? Here we go. In terms of that gendering, we also have this remarkable ceramic in her tomb as well, which shows a woman with a young baby being healed or consulted by a curandera, by a woman healer. Um, this shawl over her head is the typical uh, depiction of a curer. And uh, we normally have a hard time understanding how ceramics relate to uh, the grave contents. There often doesn't seem to be a match between the decorations or the uh, imagery on the vessel with the individual, but in this case, there may have been a link. So female role, male role with the seniority cow. Reminds one of those Egyptian women pharaohs like Nefertiti, who was female but was depicted as a male as part of the ability to establish her as in a position of power. It turns out, by the way, that the uh, people working at the El Brujo site have done facial reconstruction of the senor's uh, re human remains, and this is a model that was made of how she may have actually appeared in life. <laughs> so um, that's almost the end, except uh, a couple of other interesting things. Um, and I saved the earliest high-status burial that was ever found on the north coast of Peru to discuss last, because it was really the, the Sipan burials that were the breakthrough moment for Moche studies. But back in 1946, there was something called the Viru Valley Project, um, which was put together um, by this chap here, dressed in the you know, com complete archaeologist togs, you know, <laughs> which I could dress that way. You know? I once gave a friend a pith helmet as a going away present to Peru, and he laughed in my face. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I wouldn't wear it. Um, and um, they dug at a site in another valley, the Viru Valley, called Huaca de la Cruz, and found a pretty spectacular burial. The uh, only trouble was it was 1946. Um, it was very hard to publish in color. Um, and it got studied. It got reported very well for its time. Okay, uh, uh, William Duncan Strong was actually from Columbia University, and uh, William Bennett also was involved from Yale, and this uh, man, Clifford Evans, wound up in the Smithsonian Institution. So um, it's a very famous burial, but it, it was published in 1952, actually, and then it was never sort of re-examined. So I decided to re-examine it. And um, it's fascinating because um, if you notice, it's not, well, it's not got a lot of metal in it. It's got very little metal, just a couple of um, items that went over the eyes and over the nose and mouth, little pieces of gold, okay? And um, it, it doesn't have all those gold ornaments, but it does have gourds, gourd bowls, and lots of them, all placed over the face of this uh, adult man who was clearly a person of importance. And the Senora de Cao actually had a gold bowl in the shape of a gourd bowl on her face. But look at this. Look at all of the ceramics. So stirrup spout ceramics are those classic moche uh, ceramics with the stirrup style spout, OK? Um, nine of them. And um, other fine wares, they say other finely made vessels, OK? Uh, I think six of them and so forth and so on. There's actually the, the, um, the Waka de la Cruz warrior priest, as he's known, has more fine ceramics in them, although the quality varies, than a lot of the other burials we've been talking about. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a radiocarbon date for this guy because, well, it was 1946. Radiocarbon dating was just starting to be done. And no one's gotten back and dated him since. But I'm working with the National Museum of Peru to actually get some remains that are still existing from the burial itself and get a radiocarbon date. Because I suspect that this is, an er this is either an early example of a high-status individual being uh, buried with all the generally the same kinds of things we see in the other burials, but um, but because perhaps he's, he's either early and so he doesn't have as much gold, or he's just a poor lord, you know. <laughs> just, 
just like in, in uh, Renaissance Europe, you know, everyone could be an aristocrat, or you could have a lot of aristocrats, but there were poor aristocrats and there were rich aristocrats. So you have your title and your rank, but your actual wealth may have varied. So it may be that he's an early lord, and so he got a lot of ceramics, or that he was a poor lord, uh, or that there was some other factor involved, um, that he, he got ceramics instead of gold. <clears throat> now, what about the other 99%? We're talking about these one percenters. Um, well, I, I, I did a study of that, too. I found all the available data I could find, and there's lots more out there, but I sort of grabbed what I could of, um, of Moche commoners, um, and I found 25 individuals um, from the Wakas de Moche itself. Again, that guy, Christopher Donnett, he, does an amazing, he did amazing work. Um, and um, a, a nearby site called Cerro Blanco, and nine individuals from a Moche settlement in Huanchaco. And these folks, now of course you might say, well, anyone buried at the Wagas de Moche could have been elite. Well, yes, they may have been higher ranking than elsewhere, but they clearly weren't in the upper ranks of the elite, um, as best one can be judged, if you go on the basis of the artifacts. Okay. Um, and Huanchaco definitely was a small community by the sea. It was not a wealthy town. It was just a small settlement. And um, in looking at those, what I found is there's lots of stirrup spout bottles, like this one, sometimes up to eight per person, um, many jars, up to 35 per person, um, and yet almost every burial has at least a little bit of copper. Most of that copper is now, just, you know, when it was excavated, it was just crumbly, couldn't be identified as to what the object was. Sometimes it seemed to just be a little bit of of copper snipped off from something. Um, but 21 out of those uh, 33, uh, 34 burials had copper. And of course, a lot of these were kids. So you know they were in a different category, infants. So they may not have had copper because they were infants. Because they were infants. Because they were infants. <laughs> now, we're getting, we get cut off from the video stream at 7. So if you're cutting off, see you later. But I'm not quite finished. Um, and there are typical, no, well-known types of ceramics. These uh, are called floreros because they look like flower pots. See, this is science. Um, these are called concheros. Okay? Uh, they used to be called corn poppers, but they didn't, never popped corn. Okay? We actually don't know what they were used for. We're doing a study here at the Peabody Museum. Uh, we have a whole bunch of these, and we have fragments of them. And we're doing a study of actually no one's done this. I mean, we're looking at the residues or find, trying to find residues in these kinds of vessels to see what do they actually hold. But the interesting thing is, um, while floreros are pretty much distributed among everybody, women and men, sometimes women have more of them than men do, and even young people have them, but the concheros are found only with men. Except for one. There's one burial of an adult female, supposedly, that has a conchero. But you wonder, did they sex the burial right? Remains to be seen. So there's lots of stuff to be done with the, uh, the 99%. Um, you just have to go find them. And uh, there have been some excavations. Uh, we need to do more. <clears throat> so in summary, um, we have uh, high status burials and over and over and over again, all of those men, and even the women, at least in many cases, like the Senora de Cal, are buried as warriors. Now, were they real warriors in their day? Well, the women probably weren't warriors. Even the men may not have been warriors, but they were buried as warriors. <clears throat> so, interestingly enough, um, the art interpretations suggested priestly roles for these elites because on the pottery they are often shown in these ritual poses of exchanging goblets, presumably of human blood and things like that. But <clears throat> if you look at the archaeological evidence, it suggests that what they're being represented as is warriors, which is why I think it's appropriate to call them kings and queens. Okay? Because, now that's our term, and it's not their term. We don't know what their language was, actually. And it's always a question of, 
On the one hand, if you call them kings and queens, are you basically imposing a Western European concept on an, on an ancient culture in which things were conceived very differently? You could argue that. On the other hand, not to call them kings and queens, when the evidence seems to be very strong that these people were taking on political roles, seems to be denying them a generic role that seems to fit them and seems to be common the world over. In other words, we use the term kings and queens loosely to refer to all sorts of kinds of rulers around the world who have power, even though their names may be different and their exact political roles may be different, but it generically works. So I'm calling them kings and queens. Um, my wife and I argue about this all the time, but um, I'm open to uh, discussion. I just wanted to end by saying that Harvard University is pursuing Moche studies in many different ways, not just my study. So we have Michelle Kuhn's uh, recent, P I like to think of it as recent PhD, who did an amazing study of a small moche site called the Kappa Dos and found out very interesting things such as that a distinctive ceramic style followed the canal system in the valley. So it may be that the ceramics, although there does seem to be some relationship to changes through time, might have been more related to um, a community that was strung out along irrigation systems, okay? And we have um, Ari Karamanica, a current graduate student who's doing amazing work on ancient landscapes being reconstructed, uh, uh, reconstructing ancient landscapes and doing landscape archaeology in the Chicama Valley, uh, work that relates to El Ninos and flooding and, and relates directly to contemporary concerns as well as ancient ones. So these studies are not just to produce interesting cocktail talk, they do relate to fundamental issues about how, where we came from, how we changed, how people organized themselves politically in the past, and how they confronted the problems of just everyday life, as well as the extraordinary ones like El Nino's. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm willing to take questions. Thanks. <laughs>